Hey, well, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see so many of you on a bright, beautiful Saturday morning here in the fall in Lake Jackson, Ron and Carol's hometown since the late 1960s when they decided they wanted to get out of snowy Pittsburgh and that you could deliver babies in Texas just as well as you could deliver them anywhere else. So I know you are all excited this week about voting in the most important election of our lifetime. <laughs> Woohoo! You know, I, I, I told Paul at my wife this morning, I said, you know, maybe if I make it to 80 or 90, I'll be looking at whatever kind of device we have for consuming news when I'm 80 or 90, and there'll be someone on there saying, well, the election tomorrow is only of moderate importance, not that important. Yeah, vote if you want, vote if you don't. But you might ask yourselves, uh, a lot of you are obviously familiar with the Mises Institute. Why is the Mises Institute, which is largely dedicated to talking about economics of a certain variety and, and also about liberty and libertarianism generally, why are we having a conference on media? I, I think the short answer to that question is that I don't think liberty or economic science could advance without truth. I think the answer to that question is truth. Uh, how we consume information is in, in very large part shaped by the media and, and oftentimes the media's friends in politics and academia. So without truth, we don't really have a starting point for any kind of real knowledge or understanding or learning in society. So I think it's a very important subject and I think it's a subject that touches all other subjects, because as, as we'll see today, there's a narrative that's being pushed. So uh, we're, we're talking about media, uh, but first I'd like to mention or begin with the traditional media. And when we say traditional media, we mean legacy outlets, uh, cable news networks, print newspapers, print magazines, etc., that have been around a long time and that find themselves struggling in this new environment. Uh, and what they really provide for us is, is a show. And I think there's a, there's a fundamental difference between producing a show and reporting news, right? Those are two very different things, but sometimes the difference is subtle. And, you know, we all get a sense when we watch, especially the cable networks, that it's a show. We, we have sort of a, an innate sense of that. But um, at the Mises Institute, we have a great friend uh, who, who shall remain nameless, and he works uh, for one of the legacy media outlets. I won't mention it by name. Um, but, but I'll just say it's, it's, it doesn't have an acronym, it's a, and it's named after a little furry woodland creature. <laughs> Three letters. <laughs> so he works at this legacy media outlet, and he says, <clears throat> whatever you think of the cable shows, he said, it is ten times worse than you imagine behind the scenes. Just the, the, the it, lack of intelligence amongst the presenters, the, the narrative storylines being pushed upon them, the, the petty backstabbing, the egos, the intrigue, the extramarital affairs going on behind the scenes, the constant turnover. He said, whatever you think of cable news, he says, you have no idea what it's really like. And, and I'm going to tend to believe him. So, again, there's a difference between telling a story between crafting a story or a narrative and reporting news. And that doesn't mean that what we watch or consume in the traditional media is made up. It doesn't mean that it's conspiratorial. It doesn't mean that, that they don't actually report on organic or spontaneous events. Uh, I, lots of these things happen in, in politics, in, in weather, in science, et cetera. And, and these are real things. So I'm not, I'm not implying that. But you know, sometimes you look at something and, and it's very difficult to tell exactly what the narrative is. And I think this migrant caravan story is just, is just bizarre on so many levels. And, and I, whatever is happening, I know that what it is is different from what I'm being told. That's the only thing I know for sure. Whether this whole caravan is a manufactured political stunt, uh, I do not know. But they're steering us. They're not just informing us. And, and beyond that... It's not just how they present the stories, it's whether they present them at all, right? Their, their editorial choice and what to report or not report at all, or at least what to emphasize and what to downplay, is a very, very, very important and powerful feature in American life today. And, and because they have a show rather than news, because they're giving us a show, well, that's the reason why a lot of things happen. It's the reason why when, when Deborah Medina uh, put the fear of God in Rick Perry and Kay Bailey Hutchinson in 2010, that, 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 that they didn't know how to process that um, and, and that they did not understand those poll re polling results because that wasn't part of the story that they had for us. 
And when someone like Iran Unz on his amazing website uh, runs for office or introduces uh, some referendums in the state of California that the public really like but are not part of the story, it confuses them and they don't know how to report on it. It's, it's the same reason why uh, you don't see a Daniel McAdams uh, talking about Yemen or Putin on, on CNN at night. It's, it's the reason why you don't see Scott Horton, who literally wrote the book on our 17-year endless war in Afghanistan, who literally wrote the book. Scott Horton knows more about what's going on in Afghanistan than a lot of the Pentagon DC generals themselves know about the war in Afghanistan. And there's a reason why Scott Horton is not on CNN at night talking about this, but rather there's some hack from what we call the Acela Corridor, if you're familiar with this term. That's the, uh, the train, the Acela train that runs between Washington and New York City. I guess it goes to Boston. We'll allow Boston. But basically, you got to live in Washington or New York City or somewhere in between uh, to be on these cable news programs. And part of that is, of course, because it's cheap to get local. The same old, same old Acela Corridor guests every night don't require travel expenses. But in the age of Skype and video conference, that's not really an excuse anymore. There's no excuse for CNN not to have Scott Horton on talking about Afghanistan. So <clears throat> the Scott Hortons and the Ron Unses and the Ron Pauls and the Lou Rockwells, they're not part of the cast. They're not part of the story and they're not granted a cameo appearance in, in, in the story. So when you get these sort of unintentional cameos where something makes news that they didn't want, they, they have a hard time dealing with it. I read this great article the other day on a tiny, tiny website, Alternative Media. That's where I seem to get more and more of my insights these days. And the article was, I wish I'd come up with this. I don't know if, you, if any of you had heard this term, but I, I can't claim it. It was called Fiat Media. So I thought that was a great term, the idea that we just sort of issue media stories. And so the author of this article, I think he was writing under a pseudonym because it was kind of a, a jokey name. Um, he, he's talking about tells. For any of you who play poker, there's this concept of tells, something that a particular player will do, some tick or, or physical nervous habit that'll give you a sense of what their hand is in poker. So he said there's tells when you're consuming traditional or legacy media. And, and he gave a bunch of, of, of terms. And let me read some of these. Whenever a, 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 you know, an Anderson Cooper, let's say, on CNN uses the term because or bad or therefore or however or nonetheless or as a result, he said watch for these terms because what the, these are the kind of terms that uh, legacy media people use when they're trying to turn a, a reporting uh, a reporting of news into telling of a story. They give their sort of wherefore to it. And I thought that was really interesting, the idea of, of fiat media, fiat news. So what fiat news has given us, let's say over the last, I don't know, 30 odd years, let's, let's just say since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Well, they've given us a story. And, and the story has been roughly the same, regardless of what mainstream source you consume. It's, it's been some sort of down the middle path between either the, the two dominant uh, sort of socio-political narratives of our time, which are, which are neoliberalism and neoconservatism. And, and both of those were based on this kind of dopey idea that there was an end to history and that everything was going to be okay now and, and we weren't going to have these upheavals anymore because experts were in charge. And so neoliberalism and neoconservatism have come to resemble one another more than they, uh, more than they appear dissimilar. Uh, both of them believe in some sort of regulated capitalism, and they both promote social democracy, basically, as the political mechanism uh, for organizing society. Uh, they both talk a lot about universalism and globalism. This, this is a key part of the story. They both talk a lot about uh, Western hegemony, particularly American uh, influence around the world as, as the sort of the number one driver of, of how the world would be ordered. And if you notice that they never, they never couch this in terms of imperialism or neocolonialism, you know, back when we uh, uh, sent people to Africa to exploit diamonds or oil, you know, that was bad. But if we send them to Africa now to tell them how to order their, their country, you know, that's, that's benign because we know best. And they don't, they don't see the hubris in this. Uh, of course, the narrative always involves interventionism, nation building, and it's not just politics, it's economics as well. Uh, we've, been, we've been fed a narrative, a narrative that I'm happy, well, I'm not happy about it, but I, I, will, I will report was, was severely challenged by the economic crisis of 2007 and 2008. That sent some serious tremors throughout the world. But the, the economic narrative as well, basically, we've entered an age of prosperity in the West and, and central banking is, is going to control money and it's going to control it just fine. 
and that central bankers are going to be these sort of technocratic people who can you can use interest rates magically as a policy tool. You know, interest rates have nothing to do with whether how much people save and borrow. They're just a policy tool, and we can use them in a way that doesn't actually require people to work harder or be more productive in society. We can just sort of create wealth uh, through the wizardry, the alchemy of central banking, a key part of the story. Uh, and of course, uh, a big part of the economic or financial story has been, well, just like we have this kind of mishmash between neoliberalism, neoconservatism, we're going to have this kind of post-Keynesian economics where you don't really need to understand it, but the main thrust of it is that the role of government, the role of fiscal and monetary policy is to create demand, to stimulate us all to go buy stuff. And that's how you run a society, of, uh, excuse me, that's how you run an economy. You, you stimulate demand, you create demand. It has nothing to do with producing and saving and accumulating capital and investing. It's just about producing demand. And I think that this story has done tremendous injury to all of us. And I think if we don't oppose this story, it's going to do tremendous damage and injury to our, to our kids and our grandkids. And it worries me quite a bit. And of course, it's all born out of hubris. I think if there's one word to describe our legacy media, it is hubris. And of course, there's this idea that the First Amendment grants some special status or privilege to institutional media. It does no such thing. The First Amendment is very clear on its face. It, it just applies to Congress not passing laws about stuff. It doesn't mean that CNN or MSNBC or something deserves special access to the Trump administration or anybody else. It, it, as a matter of fact, the, the, uh, it, the pamphleteers of colonial times were very oftentimes very anti-state. Um, they, they oftentimes were very harsh and acerbic. Um, they were the they were the bloggers of their day, and so the the a blogger today in his or her house just cranking out their own opinions has every bit as much a right or to to go uh, ask Donald Trump a question as as Wolf Blitzer does. And let's not forget that legacy media are private for-profit businesses, and the big networks are all owned by just a handful of people. This isn't some sort of benign uh, public interest industry. These are for-profit companies. They have commercials. They have ads. They don't deserve any more special status in society than any other for-profit, than your local dry cleaner or your, your local McDonald's or hamburger chain. These are for-profit businesses. They, they, don't, they don't deserve for us to view them as having some glorified or noble role as presenting the facts to us so that we can uh, go, go vote for Congress person X, Y, or Z on Tuesday. Uh, it, it really is a sham. And, and, and I think we've seen, uh, especially since a couple of more recent shocks than the 2008 crash, the, uh, the, the, <coughs> the uh, vic victory of the Leave forces and the Brexit vote in the UK was a real shock to the European project. And of course, the election of Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton was a real shock to the US project. Uh, so I think these things have caused the media to really get their backs up. And I think they're really feeling it. And our friend who works for the Furry Creature Network, uh, he, you know, one thing he said to me, all right, it's Judge Napolitano. <laughs> I... I <laughs> And I'm, I, I'm not implying I'm super close to him. I occasionally talk or email with him. He's on our board. Um, he said they really hate the term fake news. It really bothers them on a visceral level because they have been the kings for so long. You know, when Walter Cronkite, a lot of you don't know that name. You've got to be over 40, I guess. When Walter Cronkite went on the news, that was the news. And he told you what he was going to tell you between 720 and 735 about Vietnam or whatever it was. And then Tom Brokaw and whomever. But it's not like that anymore. And it bothers them quite a bit. I can tell you that. So the question for us is, what are the alternatives? Alternative media, because that's the only media you and I have. You know, that's really the only media that's available to us. Uh, and the, the amount of money involved in the legacy media is so staggering. I saw that Megyn Kelly, who used to be, she was at Fox, I believe, right? And then she went to MSNBC and... Uh, I guess based on <clears throat> on Halloween, uh, somehow people were talking about proper costumes and someone brought up the topic of blackface and apparently she said something untowards about this and she's being nixed. 
from MSNBC, and I saw that she, her and her lawyers are aggressively going after the something 36-some million dollars under her contract to go away. I mean, think of the money they're spending on studios and, and personnel and payroll, and then think that some blogger can come along and sort of uh, touch and reach all of us. That, that, that bothers them a lot. So it's, in, it's, in, it's, it's so important that we're all involved, I think, in alternative media in some sorts, even if we're just consuming it rather than consuming uh, the mainstream media. And, and by alternative media today, we can speak very broadly. We can speak of a site like Mises.org, which we're, we're not as big as the big financial sites like a Forbes or a Real Current Markets, but in the pure econ site, the, excuse me, the pure econ segment, we're one of the largest sites in the world in terms of traffic. Uh, sites like Ron Unza's site, sites like LouRockwell.com, um, like Daniel McAdams' site at RPI. I mean, these are the these are the mechanisms by which we have to consume our news. And and a personal favorite of mine, which you should never read before bed, is Zero Hedge. <laughs> it's it's better in the morning when you need with that coffee, when you need to get juiced up a little bit. And you know, there's a there's a blogger that many of you may be familiar with. She appeared uh, um, digitally at the Ron Paul conference uh, earlier this year. Her name's Caitlin Johnson. And she's an Australian blogger who really just came out of nowhere. She had written some other kinds of books, some children's books, and she's become a very powerful anti-war blogger. And she wrote a very interesting story about the narrative, you know, that w whether we like it or not, we're all fighting every day to grab a hold of this narrative or to at least nudge it a little bit. And, and as much as I don't like that, I don't like a politicized America. I don't like the idea that we all have to be so political because I think so many smart people are out busy in business doing creative things, and they're not doing this, and then we, so we end up with a lot of dummies in academia and media. Um, so it, it concerns me, but the bottom line is, as they say about politics, the same is true about, about the story, that you know, whether the narrative is interested in us, whether we're interested in it or not. So it's, it's a trying time in America, but the digital revolution came along, and it made our ability to communicate with each other so cheap, almost free, uh, and, and it's something that we all have to seize. And I think some of our speakers today are going to be good examples of people who have done just that. So thank you very much.